Okay, so here are the answers to the questions at the end of the previous chapter. So why don't you pause the video while you tick them off and you can carry on with the next chapter, which is... How do we defend ourselves against infectious disease? What's the definition of a pathogen? It's a disease-causing microorganism. You need to learn that. And examples are bacteria and viruses. So how do pathogens make us ill? They could do three things. They can reproduce rapidly inside the body. They can produce toxins, poisonous substances. And if it's a viral infection, the viruses that damage the cells in which they reproduce. So what's the difference between a symptom and a disease? So a symptom is what we actually feel like. So maybe I've got a headache, I've got a high temperature, my back aches. The disease is what's actually wrong with us. Now it sounds to me like I've got the flu. That's a viral disease. Now some drugs will only treat the symptoms, so I might take a painkiller that'll make my headache go away. But they don't necessarily also cure us. So my painkiller won't kill the virus that's causing my flu. How do white blood cells protect us from disease? Well, they work in three ways. You need to learn these three ways. Firstly, they ingest pathogens, which means they take them in or engulf them and then destroy them. So here you can see a white blood cell about to ingest a pathogen. So the white blood cell extends itself around it. It's got a very fluid shape. It engulfs it. It encloses the pathogen within itself and then it'll destroy it. Second thing that white blood cells do is produce antibodies which are specific to each pathogen and which destroy the pathogen. Now here you can see the white blood cell is releasing antibodies, little purple shapes. Now the antibody is specific to a particular pathogen. So antibodies that are released for the flu virus won't work against the chicken pox virus, for example. And thirdly, they produce antitoxins, which neutralize the toxins produced by the pathogen. So here you can see the pathogen is making toxins, the nasty little red blobs which will make us feel ill, and the white blood cell in response is producing antitoxins which will neutralize those toxins. And remember it's the white blood cells that give immunity to a specific pathogen. So in the exam any answer to a question about immunity is not complete unless you've got the words white blood cells in there somewhere. So these are all key points to remember. Vaccinations. So what's in a vaccine? Vaccines contain a small amount of dead or inactive pathogen. The vaccine stimulates the white blood cells to make the correct antibodies. So on next exposure to the same pathogen, the antibodies are produced rapidly and in greater number. Key terms, antibodies are produced rapidly and in greater number. So the pathogen is destroyed, use that word destroyed, not attacked or fought or resisted or dealt with or anything else vague or wishy-washy. The pathogen is destroyed. An example of a vaccine is the MMR, which protects us against measles, mumps and rubella. So what was Ignaz Semmelweis famous for? Well, he was a doctor practicing in hospitals in the 1850s. And he realized that doctors would go from patient to patient without washing their hands or even from dissecting a dead body, doing a post-mortem, and going on to the next patient without washing their hands. 
So he insisted on hand washing, and after he did so, the death rates from childbed fever rapidly dropped. So antibiotics are commonly used medicines. Antibiotics kill bacteria, bacteria only. They can't kill viruses because viruses reproduce inside cells where the antibiotics can't reach them. Specific antibiotics kill specific bacteria and antibiotics actually have saved many lives. So what about resistant pathogens? Now what do we mean by this? A resistant pathogen is a bacteria which is not killed by the antibiotic that we take that's supposed to kill it. Now, how does this happen? It happens by mutation. Now, a mutation is an alteration in the pathogen's DNA. Now, mutations are purely random, accidental events. Some pathogens might mutate and it might be harmful to them. Some mutations are neutral. Occasionally, mutations are beneficial. So if a pathogen mutates and through this random accident it acquires the ability to resist the antibiotic, then when we take that antibiotic, then those individual pathogens are not going to be killed. So they'll reproduce. So we say there's a new strain which is resistant to antibiotics. Now there are two common mistakes that students make in these questions. Firstly, they sometimes give the impression in their answer that the pathogen mutates on purpose, specifically so that it can resist an antibiotic. Now that doesn't happen. Mutations are random. And the other common mistake is that students say that the pathogen is immune to the antibiotic. You can't use the word immunity in this context. It's resistant. Pathogens may become resistant to antibiotics. Now for higher tier candidates only you have to be able to explain how the resistant strain arises. So we may get a small number of pathogens which mutate and the mutation makes them resistant to antibiotics. So when you take antibiotics, those which are not resistant are killed by the antibiotic, but the resistant strain survive and they reproduce. So the population of the resistant strain increases. And this is one reason why it's important not to overuse antibiotics. Growing microbes in school. Now, we do a lot of experiments on microbes in schools and for safe experiments we need uncontaminated cultures of microbes which means that in our little bottle of microbes that we want to experiment on we mustn't allow any harmful pathogens to get in there so we don't want to culture harmful pathogens. So we have to take certain steps to ensure that we're not growing harmful microbes by accident. So firstly, we must ensure that our Petri dishes and our growing media, that's the jelly that we put in the Petri dishes, must be sterilized. Secondly, the inoculating loops, the little wire loops which we use to transfer microbes onto the jelly, must be flamed. So you must flame them before you put the microbes on it and then you flame them once you've finished using it. Thirdly, once we've inoculated the jelly, the dishes should be taped to prevent microbes from the air getting in. Lastly, we then incubate them at a temperature of no more than 25 degrees. This reduces the chances of growing harmful pathogens. In industry, if they want a fast culture, they'll incubate it at a higher temperature. And this is what we mean by an inoculating loop, if you weren't sure. 
OK, so that's the end of this chapter. Hopefully you've printed off all the notes so you can have a go at these questions now. You'll find the answers at the beginning of the next chapter. Good luck!